At least maybe not in the West. No, I mean, anywhere, anywhere. They really are not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they're always, I mean, the thing about politicians is they will always pre- uh, pursue their vested interests. And um, uh, really, for 150 years, vested interests have not been um, the people's vested interests. It's always the government's vested interests. I mean, you do get exceptions. I mean, when, when Deng took over uh, in China, um, he understood uh, the people's vested interests. And everything he did was to further the people's vested interests. In this country, we had it, um, it first rarely came after the um, uh, Napoleonic Wars, um, sort of 1817, 18, 18, 19. And 1816, uh, the um, sovereign, which was a pound, it was, you know, a pound coin, uh, that was first issued, and it became legal tender from 1817 onwards. And it was, it is still legal tender, incidentally. The, the difference is that, um, you know, the, there are now 350 paper pounds to one gold pound. <laughs> It gives you an idea as to what the hell's happened to the currency. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, you know, I don't, I just don't see, apart from these just very few instances, um, the politicians actually do understand how to further their people's interests. It's always furthering the government's interests. So, as we're as we're talking about currencies, the euro recently fell below par with the dollar. So, from your perspective. Was this a significant level, or is the trend the more important piece to this? I think the trend is by far the more important piece, though obviously, you know, it falls below uh, one. Um, and I think particularly when it gets below um, 99 cents, you know, everybody will say, oh, you know, I mean, it's just on one. You sort of don't worry too much. Yeah, it'll, it'll get headlines. But it's, it's the trend that matters, because bear in mind that the whole euro system has a huge, great problem with rising bond yields. Um, they have, through QE, um, the uh, ECB and also the national central banks between them have accumulated um, uh, an enormous amount of, uh, of bonds. And obviously, as uh, yields rise, values fall. Uh, and uh, they've got losses, mark-to-mark losses. And those mark-to-mark losses are now very, very significant. They wipe out the whole of the euro system's capital several times over. And that's even after this sort of slight consolidation and downward move in, in bond yields. Um, and, I mean, I, I know how to capitalize, recapitalize the central bank. Um, that's very, very easy. Um, we've done this in history. Basically, what happens is that uh, you go along to your government and you say, we will lend you some money. Um, uh, that will appear on our balance sheet as an asset. We want you to put that money back in, or rather you don't have to do anything because what we'll do is we'll make it appear on the other side of our balance sheet as a liability to you. But instead of it being ranked under deposits, we'll have it ranked under capital. So that's the way you recapitalize a central bank. It's extremely easy to do. Mm-hmm. But what do you do with a system whereby um, the uh, European Central Bank has no government to turn to? It doesn't. Um, Its shareholders are the other national central banks who are equally in the same position. Now, they can turn around to their governments. Look at the situation for the the German uh, uh, um, central bank, the Bundesbank. It turns around and says, um, you know, what I've just said, you know, what we'll do is we'll, um, uh, you know, uh, create an asset which will be a loan. But instead of it putting it in as a deposit, what we'll do is we'll put it in as capital. So that's easy to do. But it requires legislation. So you can see that the politicians on the Bundestag will be saying, well, hold on a minute. You are owed 1.2 trillion euros through the Target 2 system. What's all that about? Please explain. And I really think that the explanation of all that will be because they'll call in experts, and I pretty well know which experts they'll call in. Um, And the answer basically is that the whole effing system is completely rotten, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. So will the Bundesbank get the money to recapitalize itself? Maybe. 
but it won't get the money to recapitalize or the permission to recapitalize the ECB. So what I can see is not just the commercial banks being so highly leveraged that they are bound to collapse in a worldwide bank credit contraction, but also the central banking system, the euro system itself is bust. Now, your original question is, how do you see the trend in the euro? Well, I think that answers the question. I wouldn't hold it at all. And we've got a problem in London because all the um, commercial banking uh, interbank settlement is done in London, in euros. So euro collapses, the banks collapse. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to see how we can see our way through that. Mm -hmm. Not good. And you and I, of course, have spoken about the ramifications and implementation of, of the Basel III system there. So the other day I spoke with Tom Luongo and he was mentioning that it was important for the banks to have made this move, let's say specifically with their gold assets. So do you think that this was intentional at that time? Um, I'm not sure I would quite discuss it in those terms. Um, I mean... The problem, I think, I think what set this Basel III thing off was the failure of AIG. Because AIG, big insurance company, it just looked at the creation of uh, over-the-counter um, derivatives as being an extension of the insurance business. Um, and it got involved with um, the, um, you know, sort of these securitized mortgages, you know, and um, of course, when all that started going wrong, et cetera, and they then got downgraded by the credit agencies, which triggered various things, like particularly AIG actually had to put up um, you know, sort of collateral and so on. And so the whole thing started falling apart. And the Fed, I think, had to bail them out to the tune of about $85 billion, which I know is not a lot today, but then it was a hell of a lot of money. So, <laughs> so um that, I think, was why Basel III really started. They recognized that there was a huge problem with various categories of banking asset, which they hadn't really addressed before. And derivatives were one of these problems, and it was central to the whole thing. So when they set up the net, stab net stable funding ratio, they looked at derivatives and in my opinion, they've actually screwed it up badly because they haven't gone far enough. What they've said with derivatives is that if a bank has a net liability on its derivative book, in other words, you take all the positives and all the negatives, lump them together, if that's a minus figure, then uh, that um, will impact on your um, uh, net on, on your on your net stable um, funding. So um, you can't use your net stable funding to fund that liability. That's, that's the first thing. Um, if, on the other hand, you get all these derivatives and you put them all together and you end up with a positive number, then that affects the other side of the equation. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, it's a discouragement, if you like, to having a um, significant net position uh, in, 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 in these derivatives. And they also turned around with gold and said, uh, well, when it comes to uh, the card stable funding, um, then there's a haircut of 85% on that, you know, which upset the LBMA. But the LB, I mean, I, I, I know someone who was in one of the original meetings between uh, the LBMA and uh, the um, Basel committee, and they just laughed at the LBMA. I mean, the LBMA were just trying to pull the wool over their eyes.